ruined Jesse now, it said, and accused the liberal establishment and Jewish leaders of not speaking out against Jackson because he is black. The advertisement, complete with a photograph of Jackson and PLO leader Yasser Arafat embracing, was immediately denounced by the major Jewish organizations. The Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, the World Jewish Congress, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the American Jewish Congress, and the Jewish Community Relations Council. And all this associated themselves from the advertisement's call to openly condemn Jesse Jackson. The Jews Against Jackson phenomenon is the latest development in a continuing conflict between Jackson and members of the Jewish community over his 1979 visit to Lebanon when he was embraced by Yasser Arafat and his support for a Palestinian state in the Middle East. Two days after he announced as a candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination, Jackson again offended Jewish groups by appearing before an Arab-American group. These events have won him few friends in the Jewish community and underscore the difficulty he is having attracting Jews to his campaign. The Democratic Party has traditionally depended upon the votes and support of Jewish Americans. Jews were influential in electing Chicago Mayor Harold Washington and in the campaign of Tom Bradley for the governorship of California. Furthermore, large Jewish populations in six states that have a total of 160 electoral votes, 30% of the number needed to be elected president. However, Jewish groups are not flocking to what Jackson calls his rainbow coalition, called a coalition of malcontents by his Jewish critics. The controversy over Jackson's standing in the Jewish community is now being kept alive by Jews against Jackson, a part of the militant Jewish Defense League, by protesting and disrupting Jackson's public appearances. To calm controversy, Jackson's tone has become more conciliatory toward Israel. In 1979, he insisted that the Palestine Liberation Organization be recognized as the representative of the Palestinian people. Recently, however, in keeping with a request from Jewish leaders, he does not identify the Palestinian people with the PLO. He has also credited Jewish diplomats with halting the fighting between PLO factions in Tripoli and has even defended embracing Arafat. But are these gestures enough to allay Jewish fears and make them a part of Reverend Jackson's political coalition? I'm Tony Brown. In a moment, Jackson's Jewish problem. Our Reverend Wyatt T. Walker, National Coordinator for Clergy and Religious Affairs, Jackson for President. And Rabbi Ma'ir Kahana, Chairman of the Jewish Defense League. Gentlemen, thank you for appearing on the program. Let's begin uh, with you, Rabbi Kahana. Uh, why did your organization, the Jewish Defense League, feel it necessary to run this ad. And by the way, the Jewish Jews Against Jackson is a part of your organization, is it not? Yes, it is. Why did you feel it necessary to run this, this ad that has been called, by the way, by some people as inflammatory and picking a fight with blacks and mm -hmm. so forth? I think there are two basic reasons. One, and I can't make this any more clear, we are convinced that Jackson is an anti-Semite, an enemy of the Jewish people, an enemy of Israel, and two, we are deeply troubled by the fact that every major Jewish group doesn't have the courage to come out against Jackson. I tell you that if Jesse Jackson would have said exactly what he has said and done exactly what he has done and been white, every major Jewish group would have been up in arms and climbing barricades. That's what bothers me, and that's why we place the ad. Reverend Walker? Well, uh, you made a quotation from the ad, uh, and I think that part of that needs to be spoken to. Uh, Mr. Jackson's uh, Rainbow Coalition invites Jews as supporters. They are noticeably absent now. Uh, but just as in the most recent march on Washington, uh, Jesse Jackson's campaign will go on with or without the Jewish support. Uh, the march on Washington, uh, there was a lot of flack about that. And we said at that time it was inconsequential. We'd like to have them come along, but if they didn't, the march on Washington would go on it anyway, and history proves that it was the largest assembly that we've ever had on the matter of civil rights. Uh, part of the problem, I guess, of the rabbi's constituency, which does not seem to be the general Jewish community, is their perception of uh, Mr. Jackson as an anti-Semite. Anti -Semite. If that were true, he would be against Arabs also. Uh, I subscribe, as does Mr. Jackson, that the Palestinians have a right to the territory and to their own self-determination. And against the historical background of how Israel came to be, 
when the British gave land which was not theirs to give, one must understand that the Palestinians have a legitimate claim to the land which is now called uh, Judea and Samaria, which is in reality the West Bank. And so Mr. Jackson uh, comes out of a movement which uh, historically and traditionally has a moral basis and a religious basis which believes in justice and fair play. And that, is not, that does not obtain in the Mideast at this moment. I would think that, uh, first of all, let's uh, stop this, this nonsense about saying if we call him an anti-Semite, then therefore he's anti-Arab. I'll make it clear. He's anti-Jewish, okay? He's a Jew hater. I think there's a great, great difference between someone who calls for justice for the Palestinians and someone who supports the PLO, which does not want the West Bank, but which declares that Israel, per se, has no right to exist. The PLO National Covenant calls for the elimination of any state of Israel, of any size and of any shape. Now, Jackson is a demagogue, and Jackson is a fraud, and Jackson is now scared for the first time Within three weeks since we've organized this, for the first time, he's on the defensive. And he's apologizing and backtracking. Unfortunately, he will probably make points with those pygmies and dwarfs that run the major Jewish groups. We know what Jackson is. We know that a man who embraces an Arafat who calls for the destruction of Israel is someone who calls for the death of three and a half million Jews. Furthermore, it's not only Israel. He is, he is anti-Jewish in this country. I tell you that if Walter Mondale or John Glenn would have gotten up on the 60 Minutes show and said what Jackson said, to wit, the Jews do not share with us their control of wealth, broadcasting, and centers of power, that the ADL or the, or the rabbis would have, would have turned red. Jackson is not good for Jews, and Jackson is not good for America. The reason that cuts so deep with the uh, rabbi's position is because there's a great element of truth in what Mr. Jackson has said. Uh, Jews and blacks in America have been historical allies because of our similar positions of being oppressed and second-class citizens, etc. Uh, and rightly so, uh, for not only moral reasons, but for practical reasons. It has been in more recent days when blacks have begun to see the connection between uh, America's past carte blanche support of Israel and its impact on our domestic concerns that uh, Jew the Jewish community has not been willing to allow the prerogative of, uh, of what is in our best interest to be expressed. Now, there are many points at which I'm sure that uh, Mr. Jackson and others like myself do not agree with what Jews determine as their best interest as over against ours, and there's going to be some conflict because both of us are minorities. Uh, but when you have 1.7 billion annually in military aids or grants or loans going to Israel, uh, more than go to all of our other uh, partners around the world uh, combined, that has an effect on the bread and potatoes question of black people in this country. So we have a stake in what our nation's posture is against Israel. We also have a stake in whether the world is going to be blown up. Uh, I would like to live to my three score year and ten. Uh, but if the flashpoint is going to remain the Mideast uh, with the continual land grabbing of the neo-Zionists in Israel and with their support by the neo-Zionists in this country, then it means we are brought closer to the brink a nuclear holocaust. Reverend uh, Walker, do you agree with the Rabbi Kahana's statement that they have frightened Reverend Jackson and now have him on the run? No, oh, no. I, 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 I tried to uh, say that in my opening statement, that uh, whatever the rabbi and the Jews against Jackson position, it is inconsequential. We would like, like to have the support of some members of the Jewish community, some of their Jewish groups. But in spite of that, what Jesse Jackson's candidacy means at this moment in presidential politics is going forward with or without Jewish support. I think that uh, Reverend Walker has done me and my cause a very, very great service because it's quite true that when someone uses that term, the neo-Zionists, uh, that brings up memories of the PLO. I want to make it quite clear that uh, I have never heard Reverend Jackson complain about the $1.7 billion of foreign aid that has gone to Egypt. 
uh, annually. And what I say is that uh, a man such as Jackson, when he visited Israel in 1979, and stood in Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Center, and in Yad Vashem said, I'm sick and tired of hearing about the Holocaust. That's a misquote. Well, that that's I, a misquote. Yes. And, and if you provide me an opportunity, I will clear it up for the listening audience right. and for, for, for the other places that I've heard well, you say the same well, thing. Reverend, let me, let me uh, finish, and then, then afterwards you, you can finish, okay? You can, you can call it a misquote. Jesse Jackson has been running around apparently fixing up all kinds of so-called misquotes. I was on reserve duty in Israel in 1979 when Jesse Jackson visited the town of, of Shechem, or Nablus as the Arabs call it. I saw Reverend Jackson get up before a crowd of Arabs and give them the old civil rights pitch. He said, say after me, I am somebody, we can win, we will win. They carried him on their shoulder shouting, Jackson Arafat. Now, if you believe that there is a deep conflict between Jews and the blacks, you're very right. I tell you that Al Albert Van, the coordinator for the Jackson campaign in New York State, is one of the most vicious anti-Semites that I've ever seen. I remember Al Van in 1968 when we organized the JDL, and Al Van was head of the Black Teachers Union during the teacher strike. And that we're getting a little off the yeah. subject. No, right? no, because Al Van is the coordinator for Jesse Jackson. And I want to tell you that if Walter Mondale would have had someone running his his campaign in this state who said that the Jews are ruining our children, that every single white liberal would have been up in uh, arms. Albert Van represents a kind of thinking today within too many black black leaders. Okay, if, if we can, yeah. I'd like to get Reverend Walker. Reverend Walker, you, you said that that quote... Yad Vashem, mm -hmm. what Mr. Jackson said, and properly so, and I would subscribe to it, he said he was tired of Jews talking about the Holocaust as if the Holocaust against the Jews was the only Holocaust that had taken place. A Holocaust has taken place against uh, black people. Uh, about five or six years ago, uh, Dean Morton ha convened a uh, symposium for three days at the Cathedral of St. John the Vine, that you may recall, about the Holocaust. And I wrote to him, and I included in one of my essays, it was about time that somebody considered Holocaust other than that which happened to the Jewish community. It is an exclusivity out of, I guess, uh, their own history that they are, have such a narrow view that they, you are not the only people who have been uh, uh, victimized and oppressed. Uh, it, it is estimated that about 16 million of the best peoples of West Africa died in the barbaric Atlantic slave trade. And our history and social studies texts don't say anything else at all, at all about it. Uh, any uh, reasonable thinking uh, American uh, deplores the Holocaust that happened to the Jews in Europe under Hitlerism. But at the same time, it is not the only instance of Holocaust in our American history. And that is directly what Mr. Jackson was referring to, that the Jews think they have a corner on Holocaust. They, they are not. There are a lot of peoples who have suffered Holocaust. First of all, let me just make it quite clear. One of the reasons why JDL was formed and why I'm attacking Jackson is to make sure that we'll never again have any corner on a... Holocaust, that will never happen again. You never had a call. Excuse me, but Reverend, let me, let me finish speaking, okay? Two points concerning what you said. Assuming that what you said is true, don't you believe that it is more than gross for someone to make that statement in the Holocaust chamber? I do. Secondly, there is a tremendous difference between the Holocaust that occurred to the Jewish people in Europe and any other one. Millions of blacks died, but the white slave traders and the Arab slave traders did not want them to die. They were worth more to them as slaves, alive. They uh, died under horrible kinds of uh, lack of, uh, of health and sanitary conditions and, and, and so on. The Jewish Holocaust was the only one in world history wherein a country deliberately sacrificed its economic interests and deliberately killed people just for the sake of killing them. And that's a great, great difference. And if you can't gra grasp that, then there's something in you which lacks a sensitivity. If I may, I'd like to, to move to another topic. We are uh, uh, now being reminded, particularly by major Jewish leaders, 
that what Jews Against Jackson, the Jewish Defense League, is involved in, and one Jewish leader called it a vigilante campaign, can really lead to a greater conflict, controversy, between blacks and whites per se. In other words, Reverend Jackson has a right as a presidential candidate to represent his points of view, but many people are afraid we're getting into a community fight in which uh, the differences that your organization has with Reverend Jackson and his Mideast policies will spill over into a black versus white community conflict. Now, I'm leading to the point of where you're advocating disrupting his speeches and disrupting his public appearances. Uh, don't you think that's going beyond your just having a political difference with him? Yes, and let me, I don't know who made that statement. It was certainly not in the ad. Uh, let me make it quite clear, we have no intention at all of doing that. You have no intention of disrupting his public appearance? Absolutely not. Uh, I think that that would be counter to what we want. I believe that on this issue, we have struck a tremendous nerve among the Jewish masses. And just as, as Jesse Jackson knows, that those black political leaders who came out against him do not represent the black masses. And that's true. He has the black masses. In the same way, believe me when I tell you that the ADL and the American Jewish Congress in no way on this issue, indeed on most issues, represent the Jewish masses. Uh, it troubles me greatly to see this turned into a black issue. A black versus Jewish issue into a black issue period in, in terms that we're not against Jackson because he is black. It's not his you, it's his view. Uh, if Jesse Jackson were a blonde Swede, I would say the exact same thing. He's a Jew hater and an enemy of, of Israel. Of course, he's black. I couldn't care less about that. I think that all people are indeed equal, but for good and for bad. Well, let, let me just ask you this, Rabbi. Your ad does say, ruin Jesse, R-U-I-N. Why do you feel it's necessary to ruin him? Isn't it enough just to disagree with him and you persuade the, the public towards your point of view? And, and if you would help me also, what do you mean by ruin him? Why A, ruin him? B, what do you mean by ruin him? First of all, it's a great, great takeoff on run, Jesse, run, ruin, Jesse, ruin. That's a clever, clever gimmick. And the fact is that you picked the thing up. Secondly, no, I want to ruin Jackson in the sense to ruin a credibility because Jackson will be around. Jackson knows that he is not going to win the uh, presidency. He's a clever man. What he's aiming at is to be a power broker and achieve from this power within the uh, party. I want to ruin him as, as someone who is a bigot, a hater of the worst kind. I don't want him to be left with any kind of strength. That's ruin Jesse Ruin. You mean ruin him politically? That's right. Of course. Uh, Reverend Walker, you lightly dismissed the uh, uh, the Jewish support in a presidential campaign, but in the... No, not lightly. I'm saying that what Jesse Jackson is about, that uh, I said at the beginning, that we'd like to have some support from the Jewish community because we do recognize that the network of uh, Jewish political strength across this country is indeed formidable, not only in politics, but in all matters that, uh, of, the, of, of the American scene. But what Mr. Jackson is about centrally, if we have to do it without Jewish support, then we still will proceed. It, it, is, not, it is not critical to us. We'd like to have their support. Just, and I gave the uh, illustration of the March on Washington. The Jewish community at that point, just before the march, decided they would not participate. And then they came out with some double speak about, well, they uh, support the march, but they're not going to participate. I don't know but what this that is means. A, this is a pretty uh, different matter uh, in the sense that Reverend Jackson is, and I want you to, to at this point clarify for me and the audience, he is running to win. He is not a symbolic candidate. Oh, no. He's, it's more than, more than symbolism. He's running to win there the nomination. Is, there is an outside chance, maybe better than outside chance, depending upon the selection of the primaries in which he's going to run, to amass uh, sufficient delegates uh, for the na National Convention, which will convene in San Francisco. Well, he'll certainly have to run in states yeah. like New York. Yeah. But beyond that, see, uh, his candidacy has inspired this great surge in voter registration among the black masses, and the idea of candidacies at the state and county and municipal level. But I want to relate it to his, his, his object, his stated objective of winning the Democratic nomination, and I'm wondering uh, even what his outside, outside chance would be if he does not carry 
this some significant Jewish vote because we've got six states, as I mentioned in yes. the opening, in which Jews uh, are in states that control 130 uh, delegates, presidential delegates. So uh, I don't understand how, if he doesn't get the Jews or appreciable Jewish support in his rainbow coalition, how he can even be an out have an outside yeah. chance. Well, there are t there's always the risk in running that you might not win. See, and that's one of the risks that Jesse has to has to run. Uh, as I said earlier, we'd like to have the support but of the, the lack Jewish, of Jewish support. The lack of Jewish support does reduce his chances. Or min it critically uh, uh, affects it, but it does not uh, it does not distort the overall reasons for his candidacy. There's no question that Jackson always knew that he had not the slightest chance of winning. Uh, I don't. Uh, I uh, I give Jackson far greater credit for that. He's aiming to be a power broker, and as Reverend Walker said, to register many, many black voters. That's his real aim, to build a power base in this country. And he's really, really looking forward to 1988 uh, in the belief that this country will be in severe economic and social crisis. And he knows that he needs white votes, and he's gaining all the malcontents and discontents. Who are these malcontents you talk about? Okay, I'll tell you who. All the, all the outs who are not ready to recognize that there are very serious real problems which can't be solved overnight. A lot of the peace people, the so-called peace people, a lot of the feminists, gays, American Indians and so on. Now when I say the malcontents, that does not mean that there are not real issues there. There are real issues. But those issues can be solved only by slow progress and meaningful progress. You don't solve problems of 100 years or 200 years overnight. And Jackson is a demagogue, and he offers these instant things for them. Um, he has a powerful base of, of whites, uh, and I am frightened, not for 1984, but for 1988. I would like... Jesse Jackson and Reverend Walker here to condemn a man like Albert Van for making the kind of statement which is right out of the KKK. Okay, but I don't want to get into Albert Van, uh, but I, I do want to say, Reverend Jackson, uh, you have called Reverend Jackson a demagogue uh, on more than, than, than one occasion. And I'm refrained from defending it because I think Mr. Jackson's uh, record speaks for itself. Yes, uh, part of the reasons for the rabbi calling Jesse Jackson a demagogue is because he says the Palestinians ought to have a homeland. And uh, that is an evidence that the morality of black people usually is far ahead of the morality of white people in this country. In 79, when Mr. Jackson and I and some other clergymen made a fact-finding tour to uh, Lebanon and met with Arafat and placed before him what our concerns was about the absence of, uh, of the violent solution to the conflict, of recognizing Israel, of assuring her secure borders, the rabbi has very uh, skillfully left that part of Mr. Jackson's position out. But the interesting thing is that I have not heard him call uh, former President Nixon, nor former President Carter, nor former President Gerald Ford demagogues, because all three of them ultimately came to the same position that Mr. Jackson and others of us had, that the Palestinians have a right to a homeland with the right of self-determination. And uh, at, on the way back from Sadat's funeral, all three of these former presidents of this republic said, indeed, the Palestinians ought to have a homeland. Uh, that was impossible, an impossible statement for them to make several years before. But it is because black people, with our sense of religion and morality, interposed ourselves into foreign affairs that it became a topic of discussion. And in a very real way, we've made a contribution to the security of Israel rather than being demagogues and anti-Semites, as he alleges. Well, uh, Reverend Walker, with uh, you know such friends, I really don't need enemies. The fact is that uh, I would hope that uh, you would someday reach an understanding that blacks are not worse than whites, but they're not better. I think that no, that's debatable. Well, that's quite true, and that's exactly one of the things that bothers me about you and and Jackson. My point is that Jackson is a demagogue because someone who gets up and pays lip service to the existence of Israel and supports the PLO whose national covenant calls for the end of Israel is a demagogue. He speaks to one group, but his heart is with that other, other group. Uh, 
And I say again, you, we're speaking about Jackson. It is a greater problem. And this problem will become greater and greater as the years pass. It's a question of Joseph, Joseph Lowry and a question of Reverend, Reverend Fauntroy. It's a question of what I perceive to be a growing black support of people who want to wipe out Israel. Well, that's, that's really not our position. Our position is that the Palestinians have a just and legitimate right to the territory. Well, and, to, and I well, cannot... Well, now, which, now, you, you didn't which, allow me to interrupt which you. Territory? No, that's what that's, just I'm talking sorry. about the territory of the, which was biblical Palestine. Following the British mandate and a petition Excuse by me. the UN... Yes, Jim, I'm going to have to interrupt both of you because we're out of time. And I want to thank you both for being here and for uh, creating an awfully lively and enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for being my guest.